I like that part of the song where it says, even if I don't see it, you're working. Even if I don't feel it, you're working. Amen? Amen. You know, I just brought to mind of, of you know, our, our need for the youth director, a youth leader, whatever God's going to bring us. Just because we don't see anything happening right now doesn't mean God's not working, right? I mean, maybe he's preparing the heart of that person to get here, you know? So he's working, so never stop believing that he's working. So anyway, hey, also, I just want to say hello to everyone on Facebook, and I know there's some people who are watching on there, so thank you for tuning in. And, and uh, not only can you watch it live during on Sunday morning, but you can go back through the week on Facebook and, and watch the, the worship service. And even if you don't do the Facebook thing, I just want you to know, and I keep, try, I keep forgetting to tell you guys this, it's on YouTube on Monday afternoons, yeah, usually if I get time to edit it and get it uploaded. So um, it'll be on there too. Uh, I would say just search for Calvary Baptist Church, but that's not a good idea because there's like thousands of Calvary Baptist churches around the world or probably millions, who knows, but uh, uh, search Calvary Baptist Church Pittsfield. And if you can't find it, I'll send you the link to our, our, our YouTube page. So anyway. Just wanted you guys to know that. Hey, if you watched any of the 9-11 ceremonies yesterday, you saw how many of the people speaking and people in the news media that they they interviewed, you you saw them and the people there, they were reflective of what happened 20 years ago. You, You heard stories about where they were, what they were doing, how this happened, what they thought. Uh, And all of them that spoke, they, they, that were interviewed, that spoke or were interviewed, they knew for a fact that after those terror attacks on that day, that their lives would never be the same. They knew that they, what they witnessed that day, September 11, 2001, they knew that day would be a day of history. That this, these despicable acts that happened that day should never be forgotten. And I just wanted to bring that to, to mind of what happened 20 years ago uh, yesterday. And what happened in our country was a terrible thing. And there are always such events that leave a mark, not only on those who saw it with their own eyes, right? This was 20 years ago, and I, it was amazing. The people, some of the people weren't e- that they would talk to wasn't even born yet when this happened, you know? And I can't believe it's been 20 years because, man, that makes me feel old because I watched this and... Uh, anyway, long story short, I was working in a machine shop, and of course, we didn't have a TV in the machine shop, but it just so happened that one of the guys brought in a radio, a little boom box thing. You guys remember boom boxes back in? Okay. And it had a little, like, five-inch black and white TV screen in it that the TV didn't work because the antenna was broke off, and, and the secretary came running out, and she says, plane just flew into the World Trade Center. And, like, and, and so we turned on that TV, and we wired up some wire, and got a little fuzzy picture, and we're, we're standing there, and we're all staring at this little five-inch screen, and then that second plane hit. That's when you knew that wasn't an accident, that history had been changed. So it leaves a mark on generations to come, things like that. So this morning we're in the book of of Acts chapter 6 that Jenna read for us the entire chapter, and thank you, you did a great job with the name, so that's awesome. But before we get into the text here of chapter 6, Let's reflect and review what we've been seeing so far in this series of of Acts. And before his ascension into heaven, Jesus met with the disciples and he gave them some pretty specific instructions and orders that would need to be carried out. He said, go into Jerusalem, go into Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth and tell everyone about me. He said, tell them, I am the Savior, I am Messiah, so that the world through me could be saved. That was their job. That was their mission. He said, you are my witnesses, now go witness. And as they were meeting one day, the Holy Spirit came upon them and, they, and gave them all that they needed to carry out this mission that the Lord Jesus had given them. And then Peter stood up and he gave the gospel message and over 3,000 people were saved in that very first day, the very first day of this new thing called the church. The day of Pentecost was one of those days that left its mark on humanity, right? This was, this was so much bigger than, than, than a country. This was so much bigger than anything else that had happened in the history of the world. The day of Pentecost is the very first day that the church began, and it left its mark on generations to come, or we wouldn't be here today, right? The people who were saved that day knew they were witnessing history and that their lives would never be the same. 
And think about it. For 2,000 years and throughout the world, each week as the church has met, for 2,000 years, right? Souls have been saved and lives have been changed. For 2,000 years. This is an amazing thing that's happened back on that day of Pentecost. And the thing is, this has, didn't happen with tragedy. This wasn't a tragedy that happened that day of Pentecost. These lives, your lives, my life was changed by love. It was changed by love. And we talked about that in Bible group this morning, love. But it's the love of Christ that changes our lives, saves our souls, and changes our lives. This, my dear friends, is why the church is so important. This is why Jesus will continue to grow and nurture his church because through it, he saves lost, wandering souls and he changes lives. So that's why it's so important for the Lord's people to serve him in his church, right? Verse 1 of chapter 6 here. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So as we've gone through the book of Acts, we keep seeing the church not only on the move, which it is, right? The church was moving at that time. It's, it's growing because many of the people there were being saved day by day. The church was, the number was being added daily. But we also see that as the church is growing, it's also struggling with many issues. Many issues. I mean, if it wasn't the Jewish religious leaders harassing the apostles and throwing them in jail and beating them because they're preaching about Jesus, it's internal problems. It's internal problems that seem to rise out of thin air, out of nowhere. That is, it's problems that no one could see coming, right? I mean, they expected the, the, the Jewish religious leaders to be after them. They, Jesus told them that, right? That uh, the world's going to hate you because they hate me and, and, you know, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. Jesus told them that. And I have to believe, though, that for the apostles, it was the internal problems that wore them out. Not so much the problems from the outside because they totally expected those. What Jesus didn't tell them is that this new thing called the church, it would consist of people. And even though people can be redeemed, they can be born again, let's face it, we're people nonetheless, right? We're people. We're human. We're fallen humanity as we gather together in this thing called the church. And as such, there's going to be those who think that there's something special, right? People, some people think there's something special. There, there'll be those who think that they run the church and this church would not go and they would not exist if it wasn't for me. And then on the flip side, there are people who feel like they've been neglected and that they, they feel as though I'm part of this body, but I don't matter. They, no one cares about me, and, and I'm just a little insignificant part of this body. That's not true. And that's what we see here in Acts chapter 6 and with the apostles, when they're not even thinking about the possibility of struggles like this that could arise within the body of Christ, but here they are. Here's these problems. Here's these struggles. So they come up with a plan, and they figure it out. But here's the thing. Here's what we need. The church needs servants. It needs servants. Now, no one can keep things running all by themselves, right? No one can do it all. Uh, no one single person can know everything there is to know about all things and do everything. And if you try to be that person, let me tell you, you'll be the wore out very quickly. You'll, you'll give out. Some of the best advice given in the Bible is found back in Exodus chapter 18, where Moses, he's, he, he's there with the, with the people of Israel. He's led them out of, of, of Egypt, and he's there, and they, every day they come, and they bring their problems to Moses, and it's wearing him out. His father-in-law, Jethro, said, look, you need to find some other people. You need to delegate. You need to delegate some of this responsibility to other people so that you're not wore out. Let them handle the small things, and you take care of the big problems. It's the same way in the church. 
The church needs servants so that all the ministries of the church can get done. So, we need servants so the ministries can get done. Why? So that souls can be saved and people can, can, can uh, grow in their faith and lives can be changed. If you've been here the last few weeks, we've been in Acts and we've seen in Acts that this isn't the first problem inside the church. We didn't cover the passage, but there's a couple in chapter 5 named Ananias and Sapphira and they lied to the Holy Spirit about a sale price of a piece, piece of property that they'd sold. And because they lied, because of that sin, it was dealt with very quickly and they both died because they lied. But here in Acts 6, no one's really, this is not particularly evil. They're not lying to the Holy Spirit or anything of that nature. This is more about church management. This is about administration that became the problem. All due to the church's rapid growth. So when you grow quickly, you're going to have problems. So here's the thing. When we start to grow as a church, which I do believe we will, honestly, I do believe we will, when we start to grow like that and we grow rapidly, you guys remember to come back to Acts chapter 6 to see how we can handle that, okay? Because this is, this is a, a good passage. Because in the church, there will be conflicts. There will be conflicts. There's, conflicts are sure to arise. Whenever there's a group of people, whether they're saved or not, there's going to be conflict, and that's what we see here. And basically, it started just as the church was getting off the ground, so we need to understand that the problem that cropped up, uh, it cropped up before the apostles even thought about such things, and before they could even come up with a plan. One of the biggest problems is that even though everyone in the, this church at this point are Jews, there's two different kinds of Jews here. There are different types of Jewish people in Jerusalem. First, there were the ones that I believe we commonly think of who are, who are Hebrews. And, and like Paul talked about, the Hebrew of Hebrews. And they speak Aramaic and they speak Hebrew. They was raised in Hebrew school. They resist the world. They resist the Grecian culture that's there in Jerusalem. That's a, the kind of Jewish person we kind of always think about. But then there's the type of Jew who didn't really speak Aramaic. They didn't, they didn't go to Hebrew school. They didn't know a whole lot of the language. And they spoke Greek. These are the Hellenistic or the Grecian Jews, as it's called here. And Greek, Greek back then was the common everyday, uh, common man's language of everyday life. So not only did they just speak Greek, but they also bought into a little bit of the Grecian culture. They brought that into, and they lived in that Greek, Greek kind of culture that... Uh, that was there in Rome because Romans ruled here, but don't forget, it was Alexander the Great from Greece who took over this land many years prior. So they're under Roman rule, but the land of Israel was conquered centuries before by Alexander the Great. It remained in control of Greece until the Romans took control. There's a long history of Greek-speaking Jews. And in fact, many of those Greek-speaking Jews had their own Bible, the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint. And that's what they read out of. So the people in this church came from two different kind of cultures. They're Jews. But you have the, the Hellenistic Jews. And you have the Hebraic Jews. And, and so they spoke different languages and lived different lives. At least in some ways. The problem that is surfacing here is that it seems as though the widows of the Greek speaking communities were being neglected. Or at least... They thought they, the Greek part of the church thought they were being neglected, right? And we're not told what happened or why they feel this way, but there is a problem. Well, whatever the case, misunderstandings developed right there and objections were raised. I believe that for them at this time, this is a legitimate complaint. Otherwise, it would just be a bunch of people getting together and grumbling. And we all know how the Lord feels about people grumbling, right? I mean, even in Israel, when the people grumbled and stood up and resisted and rebelled against Moses... God opened up the ground and swallowed the rebels up, right? I mean, the early church was, God, the Lord took that serious. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. They, they died because they lied to the Holy Spirit right there in the early church. So this is a legitimate complaint. This is a legitimate problem that cropped up and the apostles decided that they couldn't neglect their duties concerning the teaching and preaching of Jesus. So what did they do? They had the church choose other men to, to see to it to these widows, to wait on the tables, so to speak. 
take care of the widows that were being neglected. They chose servants to serve the needs of the church. And the Greek word to serve here is diakonino, diakonio, right? It's where we get the word deacon. And that is exactly what a deacon is. They are servants of the church who assist the men in charge so that they can be devoted to the word. And while we're on this subject, let me just say, Calvary Baptist members, attenders, let your deacons serve you. And I don't mean just serve your communion uh, like through the, you know, every, every quarter, right? I mean, let them serve you, whatever your need may be, whatever your legitimate need may be. In the deacons meeting, I'm serious, I hear and I've heard when I'm the deacon of the week, which is on the bulletin, by the way, the deacon of the week, no one ever calls me. I don't know why it's in the bulletin because I've never gotten a call. So, there you go, deacons. I've made that clear and I've made that known that people should call you because you are the servants of the church and we appreciate you being the servants of the church, right? So, not only are deacons servants of the church, but they are also, here's the thing, they're also my sounding board, right? They're the ones I talk to. They're the ones I share problems with and they're the ones that help me as well. They are here and have given me sound advice. They really have. And I really appreciate our deacons here at Calvary. But there are more than just deacons who serve here, right? There are more than just deacons who serve here. And we wouldn't have a church or do ministries if we didn't have many of you serving in some capacity. From the deacons to the people on the committees to the teachers to, to volunteers and whatever ministry, you're all important to the church. You're all important to the church and, and and you're important to myself as well. Because without you, souls wouldn't be saved and lives wouldn't be changed. The men here in Acts 6 are the church's first deacons. And they are to serve. They're here to serve. But even though a, a deacon is a servant, right? Servants must be qualified. They have to be qualified. And they chose the right men for the right job. In verse 3, chapter 6. Brothers choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will, we will turn this responsibility over to them. Right here is the qualifications. And notice even though the people chose the men, it's the apostles who gave their stamp of approval, right? They're the ones who, who had the final say and they were the ones that appointed the servants as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you can turn there if you like, you don't have to, but we give an even more specific example of what a servant or a deacon is to be. 1 Timothy 3.8, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must hold to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. A deacon, it says here, must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So deacons were needed right from the very start, right from the very beginning of the church. And by the time the Apostle Paul went throughout Asia and, and, and Europe and, and places like that, the deacons were a pretty uh, common thing in the church. And the first servants we see here in Acts 6 assisted the apostles so that they could carry out the important task of preaching and teaching everyone about the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's also important that the apostles kept to that track because it's the same in the church today because when the church suffers when the word's neglected. The church suffers when God's word is neglected. Here's the thing. When we become more of a social club than a place where you can learn about Jesus and grow in your faith, something's wrong and the whole church will suffer. When the Church spends more time, more, more resources, more effort in entertaining the congregation than it does preaching the gospel. There's a problem. There's something wrong. And the whole church will suffer. When the church turns inward and it becomes more about us and what we want and what we like, instead of going about the task of reaching our community with the gospel of Christ, when that happens, there's a problem. And the whole church suffers. The church and its leadership is always to be about the word of God. 
Because when the word of God is neglected, the whole church suffers. Here's the truth. Even if the church is the most biblical church on the face of the planet, they're going to have problems. We're going to have problems. That's just a reality. But there are right ways and wrong ways to deal with those problems. And healthy churches deal with their problems. Verse 5. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What we see here is that we're there's not just talk about what needs to be done, right? This isn't just, hey, what are we going to do? What it, there's action here. That's what healthy churches do. It's not just talk. There's action as well. They discuss, and then they take, they take action. You may think that it's just common sense that if you have a problem, you just deal with it. But here's the thing. Unfortunately, too many times, problems are not dealt with. They're just let go. You know, we'll just let it go which is the hope where they're just going to go away, right? If we, if we don't pay attention, it's just going to go away. But here's the thing. Sometimes they grow into even bigger problems. I told you many times already that I was a pew-sitting church member many years more than I've been a pastor. I know what it's like to be a church member. I know what, a little something about being a church member. I have to tell you, there, there's nothing more frustrating than bringing a legitimate concern, a problem to the leadership of the church and nothing gets done because they won't deal with it. And not dealing with problems is the easy thing to do, right? That's the easy way out. You just ignore it. Maybe they'll go away. But I'll tell you what, one thing worse than not dealing with a problem is to deal with it by sweeping it under the rug. That's not good. When you have a problem and it's like, we're just not going to do anything. And matter of fact, what we're going to do is just sweep it under the rug, right? You ever heard that saying? And we see this all the time. And the usual outcome is the way in which problems are handled is that dirt, that dirt you sweep under the rug, it eventually comes out somewhere. Case in point, and let's be honest, some churches in our very own Southern Baptist Convention tried sweeping some sexual abuse cases under the rug to hide their dirt. But when the Houston Chronicle found out about this possible scandal, they uncovered about 700 abuse cases within Southern Baptist churches. It's not good. Not good at all. That's why here at Calvary, uh, we're going over our child protection issues and policies and our mandatory uh, reporting systems so that we don't have those problems. But I guarantee you, if we did, if we do, they'll be dealt with. They won't be swept under the rug, right? They won't be hidden. They'll be dealt with. It's a serious deal because it comes out eventually. So healthy churches only deal with real problems, but they deal and they address them biblically. That's the key. That's the way all issues should be dealt with in the church because we have the Bible as our guide in all matters. Just as a side note here, this goes along with what we've been talking about. Just because a person is successful in the world, highly thought of, has a great business, doesn't mean that they're qualified to be in leadership of the church. Now that may indeed be the case, a person can be both, right? But I think there are men who are deacons or elders in a church just for the simple fact that they are successful businessmen and are well known and respected in the community. I think one time I already told you about the man I, uh, I worked with. He was my boss at a, a company I worked for in Ohio. And when I started uh, working there, I told him I was a Christian, right? Oh, he says, oh, me too. I'm, uh, matter of fact, I'm an elder in the church. I said, oh, that's great. Seriously, the first hour I was there, I seen him and heard him cuss out three people and give five other people the finger, right? It's like, he's an elder in the church. And then this church that he attended, uh, I found out they were in need of a pastor. And, and everybody in Ohio was like, hey, this is right down the road. Why don't you send your resume to that church? I'm like, uh-uh. I said, I know one of the elders there. I don't have nothing to do with the leadership of that church, right? So, all this to say, the ways of dealing with the problems in the world very seldom translate into the right way of dealing with a problem in the church. 
Because first and foremost, the church is faith-based. That means not only do we, are we individuals that live by faith, but the church as a whole must also live by faith, right? We walk by faith, not by sight. That's for us as individuals. That's for us as a church, which is the total opposite of the way the world thinks and the world acts. I don't know what these men here in Acts 6, these seven men that were chosen, I don't know what they did for a living, right? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't say because it doesn't matter because they were qualified servants of Jesus Christ. And that's all that mattered. That's what we need to remember. We are all servants of the king. And it is to him whom we must please, not anyone else. And a servant who realizes that, a servant that, who really desires to be a servant of Christ, is an amazing thing to watch. Because it's as if they have a laser focus. Man, all they want to do is serve the Lord in any capacity, anywhere. All their desire is to serve the Lord. Those kind of people are few and far between, but I've seen them. They're out there. They're serving the Lord with all they got, and they're serving the Lord no matter where they're sent. And from what I've learned in my many years of ministry, that is that to be true in truly God's will, here's the thing. Your gift must match the role, right? A servant's gifts match their role. You can be a person on fire for the Lord and willing to do anything and go anywhere, but if, it's, if your spiritual gifts don't match your role, let me tell you that's a bad place to be. Your gifts have to match the role that you're in. As Christian education pastor at Porch Community Chapel, I could tell within a couple of weeks whether a person was going to be a good teacher or not because, you know, Many times they didn't even make it to two weeks. But you put that same person in a different role and they flourished. That's why some of us have the spiritual gift of administration. Some of us have the spiritual gift of hospitality. Some of us have the spiritual gift of teaching. And every believer has a spiritual gift to be used for the glory of God. We're servants of the Most High King. And we're to help the church to grow and the church to function. The nominating committee will soon be passing out sign-up sheets for you to fill out for next year's, what you, where you want to serve in the coming year. And here's what I want you to do. Instead of signing up and checking the box automatically for what you're already doing, right? Place where you serve for years. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. Lord, where do you want me this year? Where can you use the gifts that you have given me? Not where I feel comfortable, but Lord, wherever you want me, wherever you need me, I'm willing to serve there according to my spiritual gift. Just pray that. I, I ask you to do that. Seek God's will for you here at Calvary next year. And if you're not currently serving on a committee or somewhere in the church, it's time to serve. It's time to serve. And you too pray, Lord, where would you have me serve? Where would you have me serve you? At Calvary, yeah, we serve one another. We serve people. We serve our community. But it's the Lord whom we're serving, right? And when everyone uses the gift that God gave them, then the whole church prospers. It prospers. Successful churches have one thing in common. And I don't just mean successful Baptist churches. But any church that is growing and, and souls are being saved and lives are being changed, right? Have the majority of its members and its attenders serving somewhere in the church. And successful churches create opportunities for people to serve. And they instill the sense of community where everyone believes it's not about me. It's not about me being served here. It's about me being a servant here. See, there's that attitude. It's not about me being served here. It's about me being a servant here. And that's a prevailing mindset I'd love to see here at Calvary and be a part of. Verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as province of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. 
They produce false witnesses who testify, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For you've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face like the face of an angel. Here's Stephen, our first kind of introduction to Stephen. We don't last too long in, in, in God's word, but here he is in verse 8. And Dr. Luke, he switches gears here, and we see Stephen, the model servant. He gives us an example of what a called and qualified servant looks like. No one best exemplifies what the church needed and got with a man like Stephen. I mean, this isn't someone who took the role of servant and said, okay, I'll do it if I have to. Since no one else is going to do it, I guess I'll do it, right? Heard that before, right? See, this, what we see here is a man who took his servant's role seriously. He, you see a man who, who was committed to Jesus. And that's the key because he was committed not only to the church, this new thing called the church, uh, he was committed to Jesus. And if he was just committed to the church and the people of the church, then he probably would have went about his task half-hearted, right? But since this is about Jesus, the one who saved him, the one who died for him, the one who dramatically changed his life, since this is all about Jesus, then Stephen served with all that he had, even his life. We're going to get into that next week. And his calling and his qualifications were obvious. No one could doubt it, right? There's no doubt in anyone's mind that Stephen was the real deal. I don't believe there's a, a person in the whole church, uh, which at this time, they're, they're, which was in the thousands, wasn't in, you know, didn't know that Stephen's calling and qualifications were obvious. They believe that Stephen was doing all these things for Jesus, not for show. Everyone knew that Stephen wasn't doing all these things in an attempt to kiss up to the apostles, right? So that they'd give him a better job than waiting on tables. They all knew Stephen loved the Lord and that his ministry was from the Lord. I was talking to someone the other day about, we were discussing ministry and, and, and now how we're all called to ministry, right? We're all called to ministry. But there are some who are called to special ministry, an occupation ministry, right? For it's full-time ministry, like being a pastor, an evangelist, or a missionary. Any other areas of service, it has to, to be a calling of God, right? Not just a career choice. I think sometimes we treat occupational work of the ministry like it's a choice to do, when it absolutely has to be a calling from God. Always heard that when it comes to full-time ministry, that if you can do anything else, do that. But if you can't and you have to, then serve the Lord with your whole heart. I don't know, like I said, what Stephen's secular job was, but he's certainly a man called to serve his Lord. And when the time came for Stephen to go out and be a servant of the world, he was prepared. And he's prepared because he knew the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. We talked about this in Bible group this morning a little bit too. We'll actually see how well Stephen knew his Bible in, in chapter 7. But here it says that when some men rose up and disputed with Stephen, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He knew the scriptures. God's servants are ready and they're able to tell people about Jesus any place, any time. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us this. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who ask you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's not just pastors. That's not just deacons. That's every one of us who have been saved. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you. Once again, I, I'm going to stand up here this morning and promote our, our Sunday morning Bible groups. I'm going to promote our Sunday evening Bible study. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about uh, any other time the church gets together, study the Bible. I'm going to promote that, right? Our youth group, our, our, our home groups. Why? Because we all need to be lifelong learners. We all need to be lifelong learners, uh, including myself. No one knows everything, right? 
I learn more about the Lord and the more I study this word all the time. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the divisions of the soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As the craziness of this world continues to get worse, people are going to need that hope. The hope that is in you. Right? They're looking for answers as to what's happening and, and where all this is headed. And, and they want to know how to be rescued out of this dysfunctional world. That's why we need to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. One of the main reasons we need to know the word of God is the same reason Stephen needed to know it. We're in a battle. We're absolutely in a battle. Stephen was in a real physical battle, as we'll see in chapter 7. But for us today, we are in a spiritual battle every day. And if you don't know anything about the Word of God, here's the thing. You've lost today's battle without, before you even get out of bed. Ephesians 6. You can turn there if you have your Bibles open still. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There's what we talked about in Bible group, the world, right? The world isn't the creation. It's not the people in it. The world refers to the world system. The world system is evil. Amen? We've seen that very clearly. They're not hiding it anymore. Satan's not hiding. He's come out in full force. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore uh, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is vitally important to have in our battles. Because we as Christians, we face battles every day. I mean, with it we can withstand the schemes of the devil, right? And now, and now you know why the Bible is always under attack. It is the sword that we use. It's our, it's our defense and our offense in this world. That's why we need to have it. And that's why it's so important. So use it. It's important to use. One last thing we're going to look at at Stephen as a model servant is he stood up for Jesus. We talked about this thing, very thing, the last few weeks. Guys, there may be a time real soon that we need to stand up for Jesus. So the question is, are you ready? And are you able to do that? Now know this, there's no way you can be a servant of the Lord. We're talking about servants, right? Until you're reconciled to him. You can't be a real servant of the Lord unless you, you know him as your personal savior and have that right relationship with him. The apostles, as well as Stephen, were telling everyone that they needed to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And here's saying, if you're here this morning and you've never done that, you've never been saved and you have that desire this morning, then please come forward. Please come. And, and you don't have to hold on to your pride or anything else to get, let that get in the way of where you spend eternity. Let the Lord save you today. That's his will for you. So let the Lord Jesus have his way. So please come forward this morning as we sing a closing song. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for men like Stephen and the apostles. And Lord, we thank you for wisdom that you give your church. Lord, we need more wisdom. We need, we need the boldness. We need everything, Lord, that you gave those apostles on that first, first day there of the church where 3,000 people saved. Because we have the same mission. Talk about Mission Illinois offering, Lord. That's the same mission you, you gave them. Reach out to people so souls can be saved and lives can be changed. 
Lord, I pray that for Pittsfield. I really do. I, I pray for revival here. Pray for revival in our own church, Lord, that people get on fire for you and they, they serve you with their whole heart. Not, not serving Calvary Baptist, but serving you. Pray for that. Lord, we ask for that. And we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name. please. Heavenly Father, I just uh, pray that you will uh, give me the strength to uh, take the gift that you have given me to become a more powerful servant for you, Lord, that I may be able to uh, be able to get out there and witness to the people that need you the most, Lord. So I just pray that you will strengthen my gift. Let me to uh, be able to work with that gift to do your glory, Lord. That all the glory may be yours, not mine. So I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.